Uh, welcome everybody. I'd like to call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting to order. Um, let's start with roll call. Mayor uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Oh, Chair, sorry. Commissioner Rodriguez. Commissioner Barton. Um, Interim Executive Director Harold Dominguez. Tinder Daniels, County Supervisor. Molly O'Donnell, Housing and Community Investment Director. Lisa Gallagher, Regional Manager. Commissioner Diablo. Commissioner Diablo Perry. Two orders. And do we have any agenda revisions and submissions at that point? Any revisions, please? No? Okay. Uh, let's review. Uh, are there any comments on the uh, October 18th minutes? Any revisions to that? No, can I have a motion to move the minutes? I move approval. Second. Let's be moved by Commissioner uh, Waller, second by Commissioner Delano Perry to move the October 18, 2022 minutes. We are at public invite to be heard. Do we have a motion? I'm sorry. Aye. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So uh, we have a couple of public people here from the public that would like to be heard. Um, let's go with Matt, I guess, first. Matt, you can get you. Thank you, Madam Chair, welcome back. Um, good evening, uh, my name is Matthew Popkin. I'm a resident of South Park Park. Um, recently moved to Longmont, well, I guess, not recently anymore, about 18 months ago. So, a year and a half, sounds longer. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and address you guys. I think this is the first time I've joined um, a council or commissioner's meeting. Um, I wanted to talk specifically on uh, the energy transition, and it's relevant for today's conversation in two ways. Um, but, but first, a, a quick background on me. My day job is working for Rocky Mountain Institute, helping um, cities pursue large-scale renewable energy, community solar, um, electrification, and resilience uh, initiatives. This is relevant today um, for two reasons. The first is when we're thinking about housing and the building stock, um, we're looking at pricing, we're looking at costs. Um, the more efficient that we can build our buildings um, and maintain existing buildings, the cheaper and more cost-effective will be over time. The second reason is because I share this uh, commission's council's goals, both, um, for in terms of uh, 2030 long-term clean energy, uh, not long-term, 2030 uh, 100% renewable energy goals, um, electrification, including the strategy recently passed by this body, um, technically city council, I'm getting my commissions confused here, um, as well as community solar pilot project initiatives and resilience goals. Um, both resilience from natural hazards, heat, winter storms, um, as well as uh, other geopolitical events and inflation and other costs there. In fact, some of the most cost effective ways to reduce ongoing living expenses increasing is to address efficiency. Um, and that's energy efficiency has been called the first, the fifth, the invisible fuel. That's been called the largest, the cheapest, the safest, and the cleanest fuel because it's just using less. And what I wanted to uh, speak to this body today about is how we can do more to support energy efficiency in our community to achieve all of the goals that we all care about here, both for this specific commission as well as for city council at large. Um, the largest municipal electric utility in the country CPS Energy is based in San Antonio. They serve about 1.5 million people. Um, they recently had a third party audit done of their energy efficiency program. It was about a decade long. They found that for every dollar invested, they saved about $2. That's exactly what it means. They had a two to one co a benefit cost ratio for their program. I bring this up because this is incredibly important for all of the goals that the council has already set that Longmont and PRPA have as well. I personally, when I moved here, uh, one of the first things I did after getting over all the paperwork and buying a house was um, actually get an energy audit of the Efficiency Works program that exists in this area. Um, my experience was great. I went through and then did uh, reinstallation of my house, up updated some air sealing, and made my house more efficient. That also reduced my energy bills. Um, approximately, the Efficiency Works program estimates that about 9,000 other households at least through 2019 when data is available, have um, gone through similar processes. Let's extrapolate that to today, say in about 14,000. I'll be generous and add another 5,000 throughout the pandemic. Uh, 
uh, even though the program uh, slowed down a little bit. So that's 14,000 households to date. The reason that number is important is because there are about one, uh, 140,000 households across PRPA. So let's assume about 10% of households have gone through an efficiency program, excluding businesses as well, which is a small amount as well. We're looking at 10% of the community that is more efficient now. That's 90% that has a long way to go. And that's really important for all of those goals that I started off at up front. So my point today is that as you consider housing overall, again, not specifically necessarily at this agenda, but long, longer term planning for housing, longer term planning for uh, city council retreat agenda items, and longer term planning for <coughs> renewable energy targets, electrification targets, EV targets, community solar targets, resilience targets, that you consider the role that energy efficiency will have in a cost-effective energy transition for the long run. So that's it. I completely agree with LPC's targets, PRPA's goals, uh, this council's goals, um, and frankly, the goal to keep everyday living expenses more manageable. Um, so I hope you'll consider this as you do um, consider multiple items going forward for a long-term and short-term Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Do we have anybody else from the public that would like to speak? Well, first I want to uh, thank you all for giving us some money towards grocery shopping. Maybe I can stand up. Um, and between the LHA staff, which is mostly Lisa, and Via, who the gal over there, her name is also Lisa, put together a grocery shopping list, or at least uh, routes, and today was the first day that we did one. And so I thought you guys might like to kind of hear how it went. I rode the entire time with the route and it was really exciting to me. So here are my, my first day things. We got a 20 passenger van, which they had originally told us we'd probably get a 10 to 12, but we got a 20 passenger van today, which is really quite nice. And they said that would probably always be what we will get, which is great because then we can grow, okay? Um, if at all possible, the driver today was excellent. Um, and he's driven with Via for a long time. He knows a lot of the people at the places, so he was really good. If at all possible, we've asked if he could be the majority of the time the driver, so we'll see how that works. We did six housing uh, authority facilities today. One did not have any uh, people who had signed up, so we did six of them, which by the way, we started at eight, we ended at 2.30, so I mean, we were going the whole time, okay? Uh, we took 21 residents, we had seven people with walkers, three people with canes, and one person with a wheelchair, which we did not know that we were getting. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but it all worked out good. Um, we had all ages from 90s on down, male, female. Um, so we went today to two King Supers, the one that's on our main and about 24th and the other which is over at 17th and Pace. So we went to both of those places today, which is what people had said. Now the next time that we go, which is going to be on the 17th of this month, will be to Walmart. But today we did go to um, King Supers. We, I actually went into each one of the facilities and talked to the manager and said, here we are, um, we're bringing in people today. And so because they only have an hour to shop, one of the things that would really help us is if you could open a line just for them, you know, to get them through because we don't want to have to leave anybody behind. And we sort of told them that if they weren't ready to go, that they'd get left behind, but we weren't going to do that on the first day. <laughs> Second day, we were not the first day. Um, and that worked out really good because they, each one of the stores gave us a person and they gave us a line. So our people got through there really fast. And we had prompted them and said, you got to be out there five minutes before you know, the bus comes and get through that line, get your stuff paid for and, and whatnot. So that worked out really good. So I will have to say that to King Supers to help us out really good today. When we go to Walmart, I think I'll ask the same question, you know, because I think that that worked out really, really great. Our first pickup this morning was at eight o'clock. And then uh, we finally got back to our vehicles at about 2.30 this afternoon. And it, like I said, everybody had an hour at the store, and that worked out just right for them because when we went to pick them up, they were ready to go. Yeah. So that that has worked out really smoothly. Um, okay. What have we learned from today? Of course, there would be some things. Um, it looks like we may need to adjust the schedule a little bit. Be is going to work on that. We had a little bit of a 
break in time there where we didn't have a lot to do. And then we ended up being 15 minutes late to another one. So they'll work on that, adjusting that schedule. Um, we need to have a good understanding of how many walkers and how many wheelchairs because that wheelchair took a little bit of time to get it in plus they were confused how to fix it. But anyway, it got going. Um, there, we need a way to differentiate the bags. The bags, by the way, were really great. We put, when they came out with their groceries, we had an individual bag for each one of them so that they put them in and they wouldn't mix with anybody else's and then we ended up with all these blue bags. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up that when we got to the place to unload them, we had to actually kind of open the bags and figure out whose was what. So we will figure out a way, and they're working on that idea, but I think it's probably gonna be something simple like a ribbon around the thing that, you know, I get a red ribbon, yours is a red ribbon, and that way we don't have to open them. There were actually a couple of them that we couldn't close because they were so full. Um, but anyway, so that those are the things that right now I can think of that we learned today. And we'll always learn more as we go along. We got some excellent feedback. Many of the people said that, you know, now I don't have to have my son or my daughter, or my friend take me. You know, if my son or daughter takes me to the store, they go through so fast I can't see anything. So they were excited about that. They got there, they can do what they want, get what they want. Um, everybody in the vehicles got along great. We had two play, four places actually that doubled up and they got a chance to visit with each other and we, yeah, it worked out great. Um, and then one lady who actually was the one who was in the wheelchair said, I haven't been grocery shopping in such a long time, this is just going to be great. And she had a good time, she came out with a bunch of groceries. Uh, so it really, it really was positive and everybody liked it and I will say this much, I really had a good time today and so did they. So I wanted you guys to know how your money's being spent, okay? And our next time, like I said, is on the 17th, we'll be going to Walmart. We will be doing three trips in December two shopping and one that I keep calling a fun day. So we're all looking forward to that. Anyway. Is there anyone else from the public? Seeing none, we'll close public invited to be heard. Uh, we're on to old and new business, approval and adoption of the 2023 property and agency budgets. So I'm gonna, I'll introduce it. Kendra's gonna go through the budgets. Um, not sure how long Arlene is going to stay. Okay. So I, I did want to say this while she's still here. Um, Arlene's a good example of the work that the board's been doing with us and where they're coming in and jumping in, and especially today when Lisa had two evictions and some other things and just the support that they give us as they're, as they're working through these issues. So I wanted to say thank you to Arlene and, and do that in case you left before. The executive director comment comments and really appreciate it. I'm gonna stay for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, um, So we're gonna start off with the budget. I'm um, gonna give you um, obviously this budget is more simple, um, as you can see from uh, the items. It, it, we're following the same format that we followed in the past. Uh, themes in this budget are actually are the similar themes that we talked about for the city's budget. Uh, labor cost, um, inflation creeping in in terms of utilities and maintenance, and that ate up probably most of the revenue that we were looking at. As you look at each one of these sections, one of the things I would say is think of each one of the residential units as a separate fund in the way on the city side that we think about uh, the water fund versus the general fund. Um, because we, we have to stay true within each one of those budgets. That's why at the end of some of these, you'll see uh, more narrow margins that we're dealing with, and we will get into to some of those specifics. Um, Kendra's gonna talk about a rental increase. We haven't seen one for a while. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Kendra and then I'm gonna jump in as she's moving through the slides. Um, so we're going to start out with what is kind of new in the budget and what increases that are happening within the budget. So the first one is the rent increases. Um, we did have to look at every single property um, and a, a, along with do some analysis on like we haven't done an increase forever, like what is the tax credit went up and so I'll show you, show you some slides of that. But for the Hearthstone and the Lodge, that is strictly, we give it to HUD, they approve our budget and they give us what we get increased. Usually they only give you 4%. The first one they sent back, I asked for an appeal. 
um, which was the lodge. They had us at, I think, 6.05, and I got it up to 6.41. Because um, there were some things that they were taking out of the budget that just wasn't gonna work. They were trying to take insurance out. That's a given, we have to pay that. You know, Some of the salaries and wages, we're gonna have to pay that. Um, so he, he did push it back through about 7.49. So that is going to be um, at, right now it's at 593. It's going to be at 641 for the lodge. That's the rent. But it doesn't affect any of the residents there because it's that increase is basically absorbed by HUD. It's the subsidy side of the voucher because these individuals are already paying at their limits. So whatever HUD gives us is more than likely going to be subsidy unless their income increases or Social Security goes up and stuff like that. There's some fluctuation there. The Hearthstone increase we just got on Friday and they only gave us 7.2%. Um, he did see that the Hearthstone had the biggest struggles and when we first came on we weren't able to pay bills. <laughs> it was you know let's not pay Longmont Housing Authority, let's not pay Longmont Housing Authority. So but we are at a more stable process right now. So that's the way those two work. We send it to HUD, we ask for the increase, we give notices to the tenants. The tenants get all the information that we've submitted to HUD so they can see it too, along with we give them a synopsis of what we're increasing. Um, the next one is- So before you go, this, yeah. the, the launch in Hearthstone was, was an interesting learning experience for us because you have to announce the rental, you have to tell them there's a rental increase. First time we did this, we weren't as adept at saying, here's a rental increase, but you're not going to absorb any of it because we were brand new to this and weren't sure of the nuances. And so we fine tuned our communication. And so we have to notify them. Molly and I met, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the executive director's report, but we had a really big audit last week um, with HUD. And we got to talk to them, and it was also a chance for us to talk to them about what the budget issues are, what's driving it. And it's, you know, they never really had snow removal. So we brought snow removal in. We went to parks and said, how many events of snow do we normally have in a year? They said eight events. Difference was we shovel at one inch, they shovel at like two to three. And, and so it caused some issues. So we were able to meet with the auditor and um, he's the one that does the budget to kind of for next year prep and they said, we're still catching up because they never asked for increases before uh, we got involved in that process. And okay, real quick. Right. So your, you refer to your tenants, residents. The your um, early in your comments, you said your your rates are going up. That was a message to tenants. So we have to no. We tell the tenants that the rent is going up. The your is HUD because HUD actually pays for it. So the tenants never have a rental increase. I get that. Yeah. I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. It. Who the communication? So the first time it was your rent's going up. HUD's going to pay for it, and we didn't. We, we had to fine tune this to say rent's going up, but HUD's paying for this. This will not impact you your individually. Yeah. So. And and they get a comment period. So we say we are requesting, and and I had ten percent on one, and I had eight percent on another. We're these, requesting on these, two on these two properties. I'm requesting an eight percent increase. Here's why. Um, you have access to all the information. This is your public comment period, and you can reach out to our HUD rep. We give the information to contact him directly. Um, so if they have any comments or concerns, they can reach out to them as well. So that's all in the in the notice that we tape on their doors <laughs> or on the little footprints when you don't see the footprints. Miss Schumer, thank you. Um, um, you said unless Social Security grows up, but Social Security is going up. So that's a different issue in terms of the rest of the properties, and we'll go over that. Okay. And that would and that would affect these properties as well. But what that means is when they go to certification, if they did get the Social Security increase, it would just be recertifying their income. 
their income would show an increase, and so their 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 rent versus their subsidy yeah. is adjusted because of that, and that's within the subsidy based um, unit. So the next one is most. Yeah, we had another question. Well, yeah, just to clarify, yeah. the number you used the number six point oh five, I think, a couple of ways with respect to the to the lot. Just want to be clear, you proposed a ten percent increase, and they came back with six. Or yeah, so the and lot. We, and, the, and when we settled, it was the 7.4. Yeah, that's what they, they went back and they gave us some more. But wasn't there a, a flipping back and forth between the dollar amount and the percentage increase? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so if they lower the amount, so they basically came back, they have 593. That's dollars. Worse, that's dollars. So right now their rent is $593. We requested 644 to go up to that. They came back with a letter that said, we're going to give you 605, and they give you the analysis, like, here's why we're giving you it, and then I pushed back and said, we that, have to have this. That was the communication. You went from dollars to percentages, from 605 yeah, yeah. dollars to 10. Sorry. Um, so the next one is uh, our tax credit properties. So Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments, Aspen Meadows Neighborhood, Briarwood, um, Fall River, Spring Creek, and Village Place. Um, we are, we, in this budget, doing a 4% rental increase. That will only affect those individuals that aren't at the tax credit rent right now. And so, for example, if somebody moved in today, we would move them in as the tax credit rent as of today. So if, come April of 2023, the tax credit rent only goes up 3%, then they would only see a 3% increase because we can't go above that tax credit rent. So you're either going to get four or you could get less depending on your timing or how long you've been a, you know, um, in these properties. Um, and this is why. So what we did is we, we looked at the tax credit increases that have occurred from 2019 to 2022. We know we haven't had any rental increases during that time period. As you can see, in 2018, um, but it went up 452, and then 116, and 163, and then in 2021, it jumped up to 669. And then in 2022, 350. So we kind of looked at what is the average of all of those five years to come up with an increase that would help them, so, so we're not just we need 17% because that's what we were looking at, almost 17%, and we haven't increased every year. When you do that, you kind of put yourself in a pickle because everything else is increasing, but your rents aren't, so it's really hard to pay for stuff. And you're not coming down to a net income that gives you cash flow surplus to pay developer fees or um, to, to fill a capital improvement. You know, they didn't set up a lot of these properties with any type of capital improvement reserve. And they really probably should. We're gonna have to replace the roof on many of these units at Aspen Meadows neighborhood, but Aspen Meadows neighborhood doesn't have barely any reserve at all. So what we'd like to try to do is get to that point where we can start building that reserve as well. To kind of give you an analysis, I looked at one of our properties, one of the properties that we seem to have a struggle with and this will so the yellow right here is their actual subsidy amount the gray is what they pay the orange is what their um put, uh, the potential rent so it's basically the subsidy plus their rent but then the blue is tax credit so for these ones that have hcp they have subsidy we're either over or we could be under and the reason being is it wasn't common practice for these properties to say, I can go up to the market rent with these subsidies. They were keeping it stagnant. So they weren't increasing the subsidies and bringing the money in. That's kind of the situation with this number two. Then you have a tax credit here where you see, this is what they're paying. This is where the rent's at today, but this is where the tax credit is. And this is just a subset of, of a property. If you pull it all together, it, it's even, it's all out of whack. And then you can see when these people 
So this person what is from 2013, that's when they moved in. Mm -hmm. So from 2013, this is their junk. So depending on when you moved in, if you were in 2007 or 2013, you could have a really big jump or a really small jump. This one down at the bottom, this is a vacant unit. So this vacant unit right now, if somebody moves in, we can get this rent. And that's, that's the, anticip not the anticipation. But if somebody moves out and it's a vacant unit, you can get that tax credit plan back up. But for the people that have been there in longevity, getting them up to that is gonna take some time. And for some of these properties that are so, and you know, there were, there was, and I'm sure if you can speak to this, is that they weren't being brought in at the rent that they should have been paying. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's also been a struggle as well. Um, and these will also tell you what kind, this is a one bedroom at 50% AMI, this is a two bedroom at 50%. I mean, so this kind of shows you what we could be getting um, and where we're at. So that's kind of what we also had to look at, like what's a good increase? And that, that, that was a struggle, but it seemed like 4% gave us some really good um, revenue to match up with the expenses that we're seeing and the increases across the board to help at least also have a capital improvement reserve. And as we've all talked for many times, enough reserve as well, because we're gonna have to probably start building up that as well so the sum of the actual subsidy it, it, you mean the amount so not added up so yeah so this okay yeah so so this the, that yellow bar is what HUD is paying us Correct. now Correct. and and the blue bar is what HUD would pay us if we could justify it the blue bar is tax credit, mm -hmm. so that, that's different. Yeah, yeah, tax that's credit different. is usually lower, as you can see even on this one. Um, tax credit is usually lower than the actual market rent, which is what you're allowed to go up to for a unit that has a subsidy voucher. Yeah, so for that okay. unit, I just want to jump in, that unit that she's showing the one bedroom 60%, you should, looks like we're only getting about 1200 for subsidy, and we could actually be getting 1417. So what do we what do we have to go through to make that adjustment? So the the actual rent the gray is what the tenant is paying, mm -hmm. and the subsidy is either from the tax credit or subsidy would be from, from the voucher, voucher from, from the voucher. So let me, let me we finished this last week right before I left trying to figure it out. So under a voucher program, you charge the market rent. Yes, only and you're not always getting rent. No, okay. We're not, they haven't historically done that. So you can charge the market rent, then the voucher will pay the portion of that market rent and then they make up the difference, which is small. Yeah. Under a tax credit property, you have certain tax credit limits that are below the market rent in most cases and then they pay a portion of it. If they don't have a voucher, then they pay a portion of what they qualify based on the tax credit rent. And there's so many iterations in this based on individuals because every individual brings in their own characteristics and what they're dealing with. Which is their ability to pay. Because it's all about their ability to pay. And so what happens is what Kendra's talking about is so what we realized when you look at the inflationary pressures and all of these other issues, that when you, and we think it was 2017 when they last did a rent increase, but we're not sure. So you go potentially 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, that's kind of when we jumped in. So you have all of those years where they haven't incrementally been raising the rents but every other expense has been going up. And so then you see the compression within the budget that, that we're dealing with. And, and so there's no way that we could in a good conscience have gone in and said, oh, here's 17%. It just wouldn't work. And so that's why they were looking at this knowing that we can adjust on a number of occasions when people move out, when we have evictions, um, 
um, mortality, all of those issues, and then being on top of it when you're replacing those units. And then Social Security goes up because it affects people's ability to pay. So different issues. So then, as an individual, every year you have to recertify for your unit. And so when you recertify as part of your unit, you have to come in and go, here's my income. And based on your income profile, your, what you physically pay changes in the recertification, which really makes this even more complicated. Because think of recertification as when you sign your lease. So if I sign my lease in November, I'm not recertifying until November of 2023 which means you have to budget your rent, your rent that they're paying for 11 months before the new rents take into account on recertification. And so you're managing about 10 different variables trying to figure out the revenue stream in this because you have individual profiles, you have individual dates of uh, contract dates, you have tax credit limits, you have market rate, you have the all vouchers the playing into this. And so all of those are different for every individual person. And when we came on board, they were not going up to the market rents on any of the vouchers at all. So that was something Tracy noticed and researched and that's how we started. And we did we make that there, We have to do that on yeah. a certification. You can't just, you know, blast it and do it. So growing pains. <laughs> so the next piece of it. Just, just one other mission, at least one question. There, there, there was at least one grade increase since 2018. Um, it was, I don't recall the year. I think it was when Jillian had arrived, but I, but just for yeah. just so for the record, um, when, when we when a new uh, tenant signs a lease, uh, whose decision is it? What that? Is it totally formularic or algorithmic uh, what that rate is? So how could it be that we have residents over time who are not paying what what the algorithm or the formula would suggest they should? How does that happen? So, Go ahead. Me. <laughs> so the issue was, and this is why you want to pay the money, You want to, this is why in salary, we talked about having the Ryan's property manager um, property managers want bringing them in at the right rates. And there was, um, when we talked about audits and lack of internal controls and those processes, there was a lot of freelancing going on when they were assigning people yeah. to their contracts. I, I assume, I suspect that, that would be the answer. So where, where I immediately go, and my thinking is, wouldn't that be one of a number of metrics we would use to evaluate performance of property managers? Community managers. Right. And since we, that's come up a couple of times, yep. and we've never seen metrics and we've never talked about evaluation criteria, just wondering will this show up at some point in time? And in what way? As part of a, a, a criteria and a metric for the evaluation of the performance of. This one's management. actually easier to fix because Kendra can lock it down. Um, well, fixing it is one thing. Accountability. And, and, and it, since it really rests with property, it actually does. It. That's what we're trying to say. So now, and, and what you can do in the yard system is Kendra can lock those fields down to where when the property managers sign a contract, they can't adjust it. So that won't be their decision? No, not going forward. Still just the metrics, you know, that, that, that's helpful. Yeah, we, we found that it was a lockdown recently and had a lot of it. One more comment, then we need to move on. Yeah. Well, is that calling on me? Yes, sir. Why would anyone want to free rents? Why wouldn't they just put it in at the recommended? Because it can fill that unit faster. So, say you have a two bedroom that typically runs for sixteen hundred, and you're going through, you're calling your wait list, and nobody wants to pay that. Nobody wants to pay that. Nobody wants to pay that. Then we're like, well, I'll give it to you for a thousand. Then that person's going to take it. And we're losing six hundred dollars per month on that unit. And how much are we losing while it's unoccupied? Sixteen hundred. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. a different analysis that you have to go through. So, to talk about the metrics and what you're looking at is, that's not necessarily a decision that. I mean, that is not a decision that needs to be made at that level. That needs to come to Lisa, Kendra, and then ultimately me, because 
it's one thing if the property is vacant for two weeks and then you cut them a deal. It's another thing if it's vacant for a longer period of time. So there are metrics in there, but they're more complicated than well, what you Those are things we got to build into the system. Well, I can do the snapshot. We can start doing these snapshots, which would let you know perfect progress and time, you know, where this unit was at this point, where it was at this point. Um, so I think with building metrics, we're just not fully there yet. Okay. For the suites, the suites are a little different. They have um, project-based vouchers in all of their units. Half of them are LHAs, half of them are MHPs. Um, we have to go to DOLA because DOLA is um, the overseer of our public funding for MHP, and they give us the approval to increase the vouchers. So there's a little different. So we did get approval. Um, the efficiency apartments is like at 18.68%. Um, currently, they are running at 1,036, but they have a, they're approved us to go up to 1,274. This is the same type of property as the 202 properties, the Hearthstone and the Lodge. Um, because they're all subsidy based, every single unit, unless your income goes up, your rent's not going to change, and it's going to the, the, the increase is going to be absorbed by the subsidy agency. The one bedroom is about 17.65. Um, they are letting it, us increase it to 1,428, and so this is just kind of a key that they were never going to DOH and asking for the increases every year um, mm -hmm. as as the market rents change. And then the two bedroom, they really didn't give us approval here. I don't know why. I don't know if MHP we only have two, two bedrooms. So yeah, so I just kind of did an average in between. Um, and, and so we're moving that one from 1420 to 1678. Um, we do have to notify the tenants of these increases that are going to happen. And I imagine those will be going out in the next couple months, or not months, weeks, sorry. <laughs> Um, so those are those are kind of what's in the budget for rent increases. The other items is um, LHA has added a fees component to our budget. Um, we are going to be contributing a percentage of pay to the city of Lamont's police um, position to help assist with law enforcement. That's already really at our properties quite a bit, um, and so we are helping. Yeah, yeah, let me take this. Yeah, let me take this. So, um, in in looking at many of the issues that we all are dealing with, whether it's eviction behaviors, all of those issues, um, Sarah Arney has been spending a fair amount of time. So, what we're looking at is really going in and, and paying a, a um, I think it's about fifty percent of a position. So we can, and Zach and I have talked about this, um, so we can get dedicated support to, to assist us. And, and specifically, there's a lot of times when evictions are going on and things in the properties that um, Lisa needs help on, that I can't attend or that Molly can't attend, this position will be doing that. Um, and, and really um, working on the components of um, crime-free multifamily housing but taking some of that load of the things that, that we jump in to help Lisa with and really taking that off of us as we're trying to move up into more of the, the development work and things like that. So um, we tried to look at doing a full position, but financially just couldn't do it this year. So we thought that 50% was a good starting point on this. And Zach and I have to work through some issues on that, but it's really to, um, assist a lot of things that normally we go out to help Lisa with. I have a question. So, um, <coughs> so how does that leave the police department? I know we're already understaffed with the police department. So, if we're already paying, if we're paying for two officers 50% of their pay, um, so that means 50% of their time will be with the LHA properties. And I'm not saying you all need it because yeah. I, I totally get it. But then I'm also looking at the fact that we are spending extra money for the, the police department so that we can get police officers and also retain those police officers as well. So where does that leave the department with those officers? This, makes, this essentially makes them whole versus kind of what we've been doing right now. So it's a dollar for a dollar and so what we wanted to do was to do 100% and then 
we could get that position for us and him working with us, and then they hire another position at an entry level, at a lower level. This is 50%. The delta between um, entry level police officer and what we're paying is more narrow, and then we're going to work on trying to fill that out so that we can add a body to get eventually a body back in. So it, they don't lose anything out of this. And I think the to that point, person, yeah. is we didn't want to negatively impact them. And, and honestly, you know, I talked to um, Zach and Sarah about this, and, and we are, you know, I am specifically talking about bringing Sarah in to work with us because she's been in these meetings. She's in every meeting with us on every Friday. She, she's doing a lot of this work, which um, we can get a little bit more out of it. To be honest, it makes my life a little bit easier. It makes Molly's life a little bit easier. Um, but it also avoids paying overtime that we're paying now for some of the work that she's having to do beyond the normal hours that she has in the public safety department. But no, this, this is, we're trying to hit that 100% mark on this one. Well, and I think technically with her position, the 50% actually gives you one of the lower level yeah. police officers um, to help. The so margins are more narrow. So. Um, so the increases, we're having increases across the board. Same thing with salary and benefits. We were seeing anywhere from 6 to 12%. Some of them were lower, but we kind of kept, we have a situation with the housing authority where only maybe six or seven housing authorities submit to the, the employer's council. So you could have one submit one year that has these increases and you have another one that has, you know, lower, lower pay. And you don't know what areas or what regions they're in. They just say seven submitted. So we go with the same process, a minimum of six and a max of 12. Because we did have some that were over 12, but we wanted to make sure and um, to be also included in the, the cities. Yeah, we were, we were seeing the same data integrity issues um, from, from Mountain States. It's interesting, um, Gina was at a meeting with multiple cities and every city was saying the same thing. So we're all trying to go out and find the mercers of the world. And, and so when we looked at this, there were some positions that made absolutely no sense to us that the data was saying they were ahead of market because we knew from a practical standpoint we weren't. Um, and so we took the same compensation approach that we did with the city for the same, based exactly the same reasoning on this, and then they are included in the Mercer study as well, so that we could uh, make sure that we have an accurate data set on this. Um, but in terms of the data, this is, you know, there were multiple cities um, fussing about the same data issues that we talked about and the cities talked with. Utilities are looking at an increase of about 5%. Insurance is increasing. What we noticed and what we actually had our broker do is, what I noticed last year was that our insurance amounts, the amounts that we were insuring the building for, if we had a total loss situation, we would not be able to rebuild um, based on the, the amount that they were insuring for those businesses. So they kind of did an analysis and said, hey, based on this, based on your square footage, you really should be at like 200 a square foot. Um, and we were probably half and half. There were probably half, half the properties that were close. There were, there were half that weren't. There was one that was really bad, which was Village Place. <laughs> so, and Village Place has the most negative equity. So we're trying to build that up and increase it over, you know, over time so that we can get to a, a point where, what, and we should be increasing it. You know, I talked to the rest of the city. We should be increasing it every year because things are going to change. Construction has changed. Um, we're going to have increases due to inflation across the board, and that's hitting every. We're seeing four to five percent for most most of our vendors, um, and then we're trying to. If, if we do have money, we're going to have some meth reserves added as well as capital reserves. Um, and um, my vendors are going to be really happy with me when we have to set that off. <laughs> and have more signatures. <laughs> so we'll start off with Aspen Meadows Campus. That's the Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments and Aspen Meadows Neighborhood. Um, the Senior Apartments is one of the uh, properties that is struggling um, revenue-wise, and that's because of the resyndication. You know, you already had people in at a certain 
rent them out, and it was really hard based on their performance to bring them in at the new rents down. So um, there's a struggle there that we're not actually where we need to be. So that one is not having a meth reserve or a capital improvement reserve on there. It's, we're not gonna have much after, you know, replacement reserve requirements. Aspen Meadow and Faberton is looking actually pretty good. Um, and I think might be better once I know we had we had some issues with Aspen Meadows neighborhood where people were in units that had smaller voucher size. So they were in a four bedroom, but they had a voucher of one. Is that right? Two bedroom. Two bedroom, bedroom. Two bedroom. voucher. In a four bedroom. So I know they've been moving people around just so that we can, you know, get the amount that because you can't if you have a two bedroom voucher, that's as far as you don't get any more than that. But you're in a four bedroom unit. So we're actually losing the money on that. Well, to the point earlier, in terms of where, how do you evaluate, you evaluate that you're putting someone in the appropriate unit size that the voucher's for versus moving them to get a two-bedroom voucher and you're putting them in a four-bedroom. And so that's something, that's an evaluation component. So how, how are you making that transition with the tenants? Are they accepting that? Are they? Um, I, you might be able to speak. Better, but I think what happens is when you have a unit that opens up that is a two bedroom, you have to say, otherwise you're gonna have to pay that additional rent. Um, Tracy's been really good with the housing team as she's seen it, they're doing the recertification, she's letting um, Ruby and the HCV team, it's letting them know, hey, you're over, you're over housed basically, or you're under housed, you have two people in a four bedroom that doesn't meet the criteria when one comes available. So they're getting plenty of notice okay, that way. And then as soon as we get notice from a tenant, we're letting them know, hey, we've received this notice. We expect the unit to be ready about this time. And so that they can start planning or if they don't want to move to another unit on our site, they can take their voucher and move somewhere else as well. Okay. So and remember that starts touching HUD mm -hmm. when you have a two bedroom voucher and they're in a four bedroom. And then that comes back if you have them in the wrong unit size based on the voucher piece and, and some of the HUD work that we're doing. Does anyone have any questions on here? So one of the things I wanted to talk about, so you can see in the bottom when we're looking at the net income, mm -hmm. um, this is where the rental rates come in. This is where, um, so when we look at this, what you will see is Aspen Meadow Apartments um, we weren't able to increase tenant services, which is really the work that we do to create an activity budget and things like that because their margins were so narrow. If you look at, and you can see this in some of the others, we know from the survey work that, that the board did in terms of wanting you know, more, more things in the units, you can see that we did push up in Aspen Meadows neighborhood, um, increased it by $1,500. Um, watching the net income, trying to hit the reserves, so you can see the reserve replacement. The reserve replacement's required, and uh, that's required from the tax credit component. But you can see on the neighborhood that we've added 10,000 to start building a meth reserve, and 15,000 to start building a capital replacement reserve. You don't see that on the other side because they didn't have the financial capability to do it. What's really important is you can, we've, we also have to watch the net income because the net income can hit you in a couple of ways. So you want to generate enough net income so that it pays the, what's the word that comes in, the, uh, well, the developer fees and the tax credit component. Yeah, so you want to have cash flow surplus at the right. end of the year or even during the year so that you can actually pay those developer fees back to the FHA. The suites, Aspen Meadows, Senior Apartments, and Fall River all have developer fees that are due to either LHA or LHTC. The suites when we came on was almost a million dollars and they haven't been able to pay. We're down to 600,000, mm -hmm. 650. Um, so, but they could have been paying it if they would have been asking for those subsidy rent increases. You know, so it's, so it's, well, if we're not paying those developer fees, then we're not cushioning our general fund to be able to pay for the administration uh, because the, the management fees alone at these properties do not suffice the administration that we are currently paying for today. And then on a tax credit side, it's sort of paying now, paying for later. 
when Penny later comes in, and, and this is something we're dealing with at Village Place, is because historically they never made that ramp up, they were never paying that money into the equity investor. Right. Correct. So, so then to, when the developer you, fees owed, including to the equity developer investor. Developer fees owed, including to the equity investor. So when you go into resyndication, if you haven't paid that money back, then what happens is you have to pay that money at resyndication, which then takes away from what you can actually put into rehab the property. So next is Fall River and Spring Creek. Um, they are looking uh, good with the 4% increase. Um, realizing that we do not budget for the HCV vouchers because those are affordable. So if there are HCV vouchers in these properties, we could have more income at the end of the year because we're not counting for that because if they decide to leave, then we don't have that money. So we don't want to budget for that. And that's actually the cushion that from a cash flow, cash flow perspective, when you look at the financials for most of these properties, we're doing well. It's because we're not budgeting for that HCV piece because you don't know how long it'll be there. So that ends up bolstering the actual cash flow into each one of these properties' financials. And the increased revenue gives us increased management fees because the management fees are based on the gross receipts for every property. Um, downtown campus um, is also looking good with both Village Place and the Briarwood Apartments, so I don't see any problems there. Um, this is basically saying that, that the variance between 2022 and 2023, we have 11,000 um, in revenue, but we're going to have 22,000. In, in, Retrospect, we're still going to be okay net income wise at the end of the year, but yes, based on the analysis from year to year, we're, we have more expenses than we have income. Well, okay. if you look at it, we have 54,000, we're down to 41, but we're creating a 5,000 net reserve and a 5,000 capital improvement reserve. So you take the 10 off of the 54, so now you're down to 44, and that's 10,000 in the negative country. Yeah, part of it too is we did refinance the bar. Yes. What what is the typical expenditure when you have to do a net restoration for for one unit? I think I mentioned it was in the thousand dollars to hundred thousand. Hundred and seventy thousand. So it just So the out of pocket expense you know, via the insurance. Yeah, it could be so if it's a clean we're probably not going to make an insurance claim because that you don't want to get your experience on that. And our so, spectacle is five thousand dollars. So and so if it's under five thousand, we cover it. If it's over, out of the meth reserve, or yeah, we will start being able to do it out of a meth reserve that we're trying because these are ongoing dollars that we're using. So we're going to start incrementally stepping into it. Um, but yeah, it could be. It's cleaning, it could be a thousand dollars. If it's the significant one that we talk to you all about the next time, that could probably be fifty, sixty thousand dollars out of pocket in addition to the insurance covering the remaining component of it. So that's probably gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of a two hundred thousand dollar remediation. Basically just building a new unit. Yeah, because we have to yeah. we have to test the we have to test the um, Actually, in that one, it was so high. I think they're making they tested the uh, studs. Yeah, we got that back. No, they just tested the studs yesterday. And there is some health and safety remediation budgeted in each one of these in the maintenance and operations. This is just extra money we're putting aside um, if we have enough cash flow surplus to do it. Um, and that's watching those budgets on a quarterly basis to make sure that. Hobart Campus, this, these are our 202 per reason. You can see we can't budget anything for them because they pretty much bring us down to a zero balance. <laughs> they don't give us more than that. So, um, not much, I can say that much. And then you have the suites. And the suites is where, you know, those were really huge increases with that, that subsidy that's going to be a really, I mean, it was almost 200 um, a unit. So, I mean, that's going to be really big. 
we could do with that in, and that that'll you know help pay those development fees in. So. And that's important because that comes back into LHCC and the LHA general fund budget, which is, as we're looking at development and other things, reduces the, the, the amount of fund balance that we have to historically use on an annual basis. Um, and, and so they get, we're, we're shifting into more of a, what I call a traditional cash flow model where you're not relying on fund balance, but you're bringing the revenue in on an annual basis to do it. So how how was the old LAJ in the deficit spend on this scale? Well, I mean that's why they couldn't retain staff because they didn't have enough to to get they weren't they weren't meeting nearly close to market for all of their staffing positions. So I mean, oh, so they were not paying the, the staff, or they were paying underpaying the staff because. They couldn't underpay their contract. They weren't fully. They weren't fully staffed. Yeah. So I mean, so if you look at what we're doing today versus the system that was set up, so we have full-time property managers at every location. We now have how many assistant city managers? Two. One. One and one. One in the works. <laughs> so yeah. So we have two funded assistant managers to do rotational coverage on those units and, and, and so they were doubling up on some of them and so you would have one manager managing four properties, four properties. so you didn't have one per property um, you didn't have and so on the other side of it because of the audit issues when you had the lack of internal controls they had a CFO and accounting tech and that was it and that's why they weren't doing their um, stuff. stuff. So now we have an accounting supervisor, an accountant, and an accounting position to deal with those issues. So we've actually gone from, in this budget, from deficit spending and not having the staff to uh, bringing everything in into the black and adding the staff. And that's part of the contract with the city to where even though they're paying the city now a hundred and thirty thousand. Yeah, it's about a hundred and thirty yeah. thousand. It's the work that we're coming in and solidifying there that is allowing for the market rate salaries and the appropriate staffing levels to get the work done. I mean the reality is, you know, and I've talked to some of you all that we need an assistant for it. we do. Um, this is a this is a ton of work, but there's no money to do it and we've got to build that stream in so that we can do it and it's just this incremental approach on an annual basis. Part of the simple answer to all that is LHJ was totally dependent on, on uh, development fees. Correct. And as development tailed off every year it was a deficit budget subsidized by development fees and all of the, the rent adjustments that we've heard about weren't being made. So you, you just keep cutting back, cutting back, cutting back on staffing and compensation because you had less and less in reserve. When, when LHA approached the city, it was, it was, the end was clear, right? They were about to go down the proverbial pipe. <laughs> yeah. Councilman Member Water was on that board, and when this happened, we talked. It, it was a classic death spiral. Yeah. I mean, to give you a sense of and it wasn't at the top of the death spir spiral. I think it was probably in the bottom quarter of the death spiral in terms of where this was heading. And it, it's just, and so now you got your, so connecting the budget to the development side, when we talk about that update, you're seeing why we're pressing so hard on development because we've got to get in. I mean, we're drawing on the general fund, she'll, she'll show you this. We're drawing down on fund balance, but we know we have development fees coming in early in 23 to replenish, but we've got to get that cycle moving so that we're bringing it in. And that's why we're so adamant in that, that we take over the management component of it so we can get the management fees that move into the general fund to then have that annual cash flow. And if it's okay, I'm going to go out there and break. I'm going to explode. <laughs> 
Yeah, and the increase in rent increases the management fees that come in. So if we weren't doing any type of rental increase, then our management fee was never increasing, yet all of our costs to keep staff on was. Um, so it's a trickle effect. <laughs> um, so the next is our Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, right now we're just kind of budgeting what they've actually um, analyzed on our two-year tool. Um, it could be different once it comes um, once they finalize it at the end of probably January, February time frame. Um, but right now we're still looking okay. I think we're looking at, um, we budgeted for about 425 vouchers um, a month. We're at 409, but I think we have like almost 20 in, um, in process. I mean, it's taking people a really long time to find a place that takes a voucher. So, and they stay on that waiting list for, you know, they, they get exceptions. They come for, you know, can I have an extension for another month to find a place? It's just, the rent here is just so high. It just can't accommodate what our voucher will supply. So, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of people are trying to, a lot of people like out from outside will try to get a voucher in another city just so they can pour it out somewhere else but they have to stay here for a year. I mean, that's part of our um, advent plan, so. So, if the voucher is supposed to pay up to market less what the person's ability to pay is, which is not tied to the regional yeah. rent, then why don't the vouchers? Because landlords don't charge market. So you have a landlord that charges eighteen hundred, market rent's fourteen hundred. That's what we can provide. So then you have to tell that, like we can provide you a fourteen hundred dollar voucher, but you have to come up with that other four hundred dollars that your landlords want you to pay. So that's the problem, um, and we'll get to that piece of it. It's on the agenda. Um, HUD has came down with like you can go up to such and such, it doesn't have to be 100%. I think they said you could go up to 120. It's 110. Oh, we're only doing 105. Right, okay, yeah. the max is 110. 110. So you can go up to 110 and we are going to be going up to 105. That's part of our approval. So at least be able to do that. And maybe that can help us by some people, but probably not all. So just for the sake of the explanation, uh, when you're talking about market rent in that concept, you're talking about some sort of formula that states what market rent is should be. HUD, HUD stipulates. HUD's yeah. definition of market rent versus the actual right. market. Is yeah. Right? yeah. Gotcha. And they try, you know, it's, <clears throat> when you pull up market rent, you pick your, your state, your area, and this is what it tells you that area is, but it's not. <laughs> what was the number of vouchers you mentioned? Um, we have about 409, I think is my last, that we actually have, we're paying out right now. And then we have 11 that are um, for ends. We don't think that those are out of our budget, but there's like, tw I think 20 that are s still searching, trying to find a place. And in we Long have, we have the resources if they can find a place that would take the voucher. Yeah, I mean, then we give them landlords or agencies um, that, best work with, I mean, there's some agencies that don't seem to want to work with vouchers, so we try not to push too much in a, that direction. There's a voucher to issue if they find a spot. Yeah. So, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the executive director update. Over the last three to four weeks, it's been happening incrementally, but it, it hit us really hard in the last month and a half in terms of the number of people that are now approaching the housing authority in some sort of partnership. And one of those I'm only met with, and they're specifically saying, we have openings, we have vouchers. And so it's now bringing those mm -hmm. those folks together. But um, we'll talk a little bit about it because it's a, talk about it the last time, we're gonna give you all some updates in, in our conversations. So the next is our single room occupancy. This is also a voucher program, but it's specifically for the in-between. The in-between has a single, um, it was a rehab voucher that they went for. Um, theirs is decreasing, and the reason it's decreasing is 
they only had eight units and they're not they only need like five hundred dollars which we budget like almost eight hundred so what you don't use HUD takes back so it's better to try to budget closer to mm -hmm. the rent than it is so that's why you see a decrease happening as well for the simple um, then we have the Longmont Housing Authority owned properties, which is 615 Main and Briarwood Office. Um, Briarwood Office is pretty much really tight with only $74 left of uh, net income. Um, we need to, I know there's discussions about actually both these properties about selling both of these properties, so I don't know. Yeah, um, <laughs> you'll get an yeah. executive report. Well, but, and we can go ahead and talk about it here. So 615 Main is the office building that's adjacent to Village Place Apartments. And if you all remember, it was incredibly unclear as to this, the status of that property as it related to Village Place and the tax credits. It was um, on the LHA I'm showing under the ownership of LHA, but it, we, it was intermingled with the Village Place tax credits, and that's an LHTC property, which in that, um, in, the, in the dissolving of LHTC, when we do the resyndication, the, the Village Place per units were gonna come into the LHA, but this was already showing on the LHA. And what was his name? The, board member of LHDC. Oh, Stephen Morgan. Stephen Morgan, who does title work, was even struggling trying to figure out what happened. So we finally figured all of that out and it is not part of the resyndication issue on Village Place. So this is the property that Center for People with Disabilities leases from us. Um, we are, they have expressed an interest in purchasing that property we now think it's clear enough where we're going to, um, this is, and if the board is okay with this, we would like to entertain conversations in terms of selling that property, um, to inter engaging in conversations with centers with people, Center for People with Disabilities, uh, just because of the operational costs associated with it. Um, it, would, it would be a, a budgetary, uh, a positive budgetary impact into the broader LHA plan. What, what would we be losing if we sold it? Would we not, not much? Twenty. I mean, if you look at it, um, we're netting four thousand, five thousand dollars annually out of rent and expenses on that one, mm -hmm. and so I think selling it reducing the insurance expense and maintenance and operations and all of that, I think would be. But again, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk to them and see if they're interested. We also, we wanna make sure that they're taken care of and that this is well and ahead of the facility, but we, our recommendation would be is that we look at selling that property. Are there any questions on that one? I just know they're of great interest in purchasing it. Yeah. But they contacted me several times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yet. I don't know yet. <laughs> no. Yeah, and, and we weren't sure. I mean, we were really concerned that if it were intertwined in with the resyndication, we were going to be tied up in that one. Briarwood office is slightly different. That's obviously the space that we're leasing to the Veterans Community mm -hmm. Project. Mm -hmm. uh, they've made some really good improvements to that property. We partnered with them. I think is is they look more broadly at this, we might want to have some conversations, but um, honestly, I think we're, we need to get some projects built mm -hmm. so that we can gain units mm -hmm. before we look at that. And so um, we'll be talking to them about expenses and things like that in the, in the near future. So we have the um, LHA general fund. So LHA, has about almost eight hundred thousand um, dollars in expenditures that are incurred, and we always usually have to take a hard balance because we don't have enough revenue coming in. Um, 
right now the revenue coming in at 521.164 is literally the management fees and LHDC's corporate management fee, so which is $150,000. So when LHDC dissolves, you will only have the management fee. So we're going to be losing some revenue on their side. We would also be transferring whatever developer fees, um, their investments that they have. Um, to LHA as well. But right now we have to use $400,000 of our fund balance. Our fund balance as of, um, is about $700,000. So four hundred dollars bring us down, down to three hundred. dollars But as long as we're getting some developer fees from the suites, um, in 2024 we'll be getting some developer fees from Chrisman too. Um, so that'll help. And that'll probably be in the budget next year. Uh, for 2024 but we definitely have to not only start building to get developer fees in but finding and i think you commented is getting a, an additional revenue source that's just always coming in um and notice that so there's a net income in this of 123 so we're not planning on spending that 123,000. But when you have a lot of times the metro mediation and things like that, and you have your your deductible you have to hit, that that's a piece of it. And so, um, you just wanted a cushion, cushion in case we need in the budget with lawyer costs and all of that. Correct. We just want to make sure that we have a cushion if we need to add any expenditures, um, that we have that cushion. And so on the on the attorney side, you all approved an additional. Uh, as the city council, you all approved an additional housing term. And making that work within the city's budget, we're pushing $30,000 from the legal fees that we have in this budget to help cover the cost on that attorney. And we're hoping that with the work we do there, it reduces the amount of attorney expenses that we're paying uh, because if anything, we will only contract out for evictions, but not all of the other work that we're doing, which is incredibly expensive. So we should, in the legal fees, see some changes there. And then we have LHDC. LHDC is the same situation. We do have to use fund balance, about $225,000. Realize 150 of that is um, LA money sets of LHDC. <laughs> For the corporate management fee, so um, they also but that's I mean we have to use fund balance there as well. Now they have investments, you know they were actually putting money back as they got developer fees and putting in investments, so they have about one point three of investments, but they're in CDs, so we can't pull those out until they mature. Um, but we definitely want to be able to use that as they dissolve. And, and be able to forecast what is needed, what, what kind of developer revenue we need, um, what kind of stable reven revenue can we get, um, so that we can kind of stabilize and then maybe get somebody to take some stuff off your plate. <laughs> but I don't, I, I mean, I don't know what that is as of today, what the stable revenue would be, unless it's more properties with more management fees coming in. That's it. <laughs> Can I just ask a quick question? Um, we don't see legal fees broken out in a, in a, in a separate line item as an expense. Correct. Where, where, where do we account for that? Um, it is in the it's in the admin expense. Um, if you looked at the detail, it is it is budgeted there. There's about seven seventy thousand. I assume that's where it would be. Yeah. I think in terms of moving forward with budgeting and accounting. Uh, since we since we are now um, contract or as part of the arrangement with the city, uh, we're allocating thirty thousand dollars of this budget to support legal support and pay for legal support. Well, in my opinion, we got to count for that separately than just the, the, whatever else is in that line of business. We we talked about that. We were tech, we were teasing each other today on that issue to pull that out so we know what we have in terms of outside counsel for eviction. Similar to what we do with the consultant. Yeah, that's but exactly. but are you wanting to see like it's like a separate line item here to say like legal services? If you if, if we're gonna 
could be budgeted. Is that distributed, or is the thirty thousand uh, dollars uh, budgeted in each of the the uh, administrative expenses yeah. across all the properties? Yeah. Then I think it ought to be pulled out, frankly, into a line in the general fund. Now, I'm not an accountant somewhere, but but to have it distributed, there is no way. How would how would you answer a question for me, or how could I answer my own question? Looking at a financial report at the end of the year on what our legal expenses were for 2023. We have a separate line item for legal expenses. Where is it? It's well, so this is a rule book. So under admin expense, there's a whole list of right. items. Where do we see this? Um, it's in the big one. It's in that big one right there. Um, that's really kind of small right now. <laughs> I usually have it on the end of my that, 17 paper. Can you, can you go can yeah. you exit out of it and bring that up? It is. Well, if you look on the second page of the detailed in terms of legal expenses, you see um, top lines, total administrative services, legal expenses is below that. You see background checks. Then you see general legal expenses, mm -hmm. then you see the total legal expenses. Do do the bottom one together. So I see, I see. Uh, do I add up the forty one hundred, forty eight hundred, sixty? I add that up across to get to the thirty thousand. Well, there's two. There's two. So this there's there's one that's just the properties. And I figured that that would probably be, I mean, that could be city related, that could be not city related. So we could do the same thing, as you can see, like down here. Yeah, so so here, we do the same thing with consultants. We say consultants accounting, consultants IT, but what I can do is say, you know, legal, which is our normal legal, which would be the eviction piece, and then the city's legal as well. Right, but you would have to add both. Yeah, it well, just makes the document like this big, so I had to separate it. Well, I'll be quiet. I, I, when I, prior to this relationship, legal fees were out of control. They won't be under with, with this relationship. Um, in accounting for legal expenses, we finally got fired by our attorney, the, the authority did, uh, for a variety of reasons. I'm not certain all of them. And I'm not certain that payment was one of them, but it was an issue. And um, and the way this is spread out, especially with the relationship, just for my money, it would be good to account for our legal expenses somewhere independently of how it's broken out or rolled up. Yeah, we'll do okay. that because um, I think that's actually good, good information to have. So we'll break it down into what we do with the city. So we'll have the 30000 set up in terms of the LHA contribution, and then the remaining forty thousand, we will set up as um, special special counsel, and just do it that way, so we can track it. And the, that's how we do it. Point. And we hope we're not having as many evictions. Okay. So now we have the two vacant land properties that are in the process um, of, in various stages of getting development done. Um, the the suites land sunset land isn't a problem. No revenue coming in, no expenses. Over land, that's a problem because we don't have revenue coming in. So LHCC has to pay from their fund balance um, to pay for. Um, if there's any landscaping that has to be done, which is usually just in the summer, the leaves are up and they have to be mowed. Yeah, that's the yeah. Well, I was just going by my life. Oh, so that's okay. the maintenance. And then um, in the general fund, they pay over almost $4,000 on HA fees when, that we didn't even have to even pay. Um, and then the financing mortgage, which is the 800000 that was um, loaned to for a the land from the city, affordable housing fund. So we pay interest on that, and that's the $16,000 we're supposed to be interest. So, so why do we have HOA fees if there is no money? 
The entire Hoover Crossing development <coughs> is an HOA. So whenever they did that deal, so when you look at the properties from the um, car wash mm -hmm. over to Starbucks mm -hmm. down to, because we don't pay them for the lodge in Hartsville. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So to the lodge in Hartsville, as part of that development, when they transferred the property, they had a commercial HOA. And so, yeah. So the sooner we get something built, the better. Yes. So, and, and we're, we're going to cover both of those in the development update because um, we're we're making a lot of progress. So. So, um, with this said, this is the budget we propose for twenty twenty three. Um, we do send this off to all of the investors for all the properties. Sometimes they come back with changes. Um, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't look at them at all. Um, but some of them are very vigilant about looking and asking questions, um, which are, they're going to see increases across the board. Um, so there could be some variance changes um, that they request, but um, I can report those out at the next meeting if that's what happens. But for the most part, it would just be. I think, like for example, the Swedes investor, because we budgeted for damages every year, he wanted me to budget for damages, and I'm like, well, you know, don't ever get paid for those. <laughs> you know, we show it as revenue, but it just never ever comes in. So that's something. Yeah, this is this like former tenants are supposed to pay you for damages. Well, this would be like a meth unit. Yeah, the Swedes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can wait for that for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so those those are the little things that might come back on us. But do we have any questions? Mm, thanks, a lot of information. But I, I think it's amazing what you've done mm -hmm. and where we're going. So we need to approve this uh, 2023 property and maintenance and budgets. And uh, we can do this all in one sweep. So can we have a motion? Move approval. I'll second. And second by Commissioner Martin and then um, second by Commissioner Double Perry to approve and adopt the 2023 property and agency budget for the extension. Commissioner Walker. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Um, so I, I appreciate your work as well. And like you said, we work well with a lot of uh, detail well enough and how you put it together is, is uh, very explicit and helpful. I'm sitting here as we're going through this, trying to, I've got the 2022-2026 goals and objectives for LHA. And I'm trying to track, as we're, as we're going through this, what are the connections between this set of goals and objectives and this budget. And I can see some of them. The reason why, for my question about vouchers, the 409, 11 waiting to be issued, you know, comports with the 420 as a target. Um, but let me make a couple of observations. One is, I don't think I ought to have to sit here doing that, right? This budget ought to be, it ought to be presented. It, it, with all the work you've done, you've done a great job. However, to not have a specific connection between a set of goals and objectives and how a budget advances us towards achieving those seems to me to be a waste of the time and effort that went into these. And we finally, in my opinion, have a pretty good set of goals and objectives. We haven't looked at them. I don't know in Shakita's orientation how this was presented. I hope, because there were, there were five of us here who were part of adopting these, I hope when you were oriented, you know, this was part of the package. Um, and I've raised this question before, you know, we, we haven't looked at these since we adopted them. Uh, and, I, and it would be easy, right, if we were uh, approving this budget having gone through a review. The fact that we haven't gone through a review, and that I'm trying to cobble them together, is is a little uh, disappointing that I've got to do it that way. Uh, so I'm going to vote for the budget, but I don't think anybody, any member of this board, ought to have to sit here and do it that way a year from now as we're adopting the budget. These ought to be in front of us often enough. We we know where we are, what the plan of work for what our I don't know what our targets are for 2023, right? 
that are tied specifically to these goals and objectives, and there should be some. So in terms of performance targets, accountability, measuring progress, reasons to celebrate, as the, as the chairwoman said, there's lots of good work that's been done. I'm not, I don't want to detract from that. I'm just saying I think it's necessary, but it's not sufficient as a corporate board to not have this budget and a performance plan for 2000 and targets going forward so we can measure progress a year from now and what that budget will look like based on that progress. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, so I'm going to vote for the budget. I just I got to say, I, I think we're missing a huge opportunity. I think we, we all share responsibility for this, and I think the staff has to own this just like we should own it. End of comment. Good comment. Um, so starting now with this budget, would it be possible to come back and tell us how it ties in going forward? I mean, okay. I, can, I can present something at the next meeting. That would not yeah. a problem. I think that. I mean, I, I, did, I did budget yeah. for like exceptional increases, you know, for exceptional pay and stuff like that. So, I mean, there there's stuff that you, that's in the background that you just, that you just think. Well, there's so much of the work that you've done yeah. that I can see. I mean, it's like a, it's the development target, right? Mm -hmm. What you presented a, a, sh a couple of meetings ago right. comports with exactly what we laid out here. Yeah. Um, it would be good to have tied that presentation to that goal. Right. But there are some others here that are, are not quite as obvious in terms of what our target, what we trying, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, rental rates and you know a balanced budget and all that in, in quality of resident life. And I know there's a lot of activity that's gone on, but it's out there and it's right. not tied here specific, and we don't have performance targets. Measurement is impossible with that approach, mm -hmm. and accountability is non existent. Right, at least in terms of the things that we said are important and how we're going to measure our, our progress. Yeah. And honestly, I, it's, I think it's, it, it is the one surefire way of knowing when to celebrate. You know, you're probably giving each other high fives every day because of the good work that's going on. Um, but one way, one way to be sure is like, we know we got it, you know? Yeah. So let's celebrate for five minutes and then get back to work. But that's part of the value of this. So if I may, I, we adopted those goals by the, we, they were in progress for several months and then we adopted them um, early March of this year. So I think at our next meeting, which is January 31st, that's a, almost a year. Um, and then going forward, we can tie it to the budget, but maybe January 31st would be good. We can tie it to the budget and generally do an update on, on um, what we've accomplished in 2022 and what is on part of However, I do have to say that in each property, I saw goals and targets for every single property that we um, addressed tonight. So, um, yeah, I think we need to be I, more explicit. Yeah, I do think yeah. we do have targets and goals, and and um, I saw them in each property that you presented it with, uh, with the reserves, with the uh, different accounts for net, um, and where you wanted to be with each property. So I do see targets and goals here. I think I think part I think I think part of it is, you know, the one that was probably the most prominent is tenant services. Mm -hmm. And and you can see where we hit some of them, but we couldn't hit others just because of the financial constraints. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll come back and give that to you all. Okay. Are there any other comments? All right, let's vote on um, let's vote on approving this budget. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. So now we have uh, some resolutions that we need to go through. Are you going to present on these? Yeah, briefly, okay. briefly. So um, go ahead. So. The first one you have in your packet for item 5B, this is the um, approval of the fair market, um, I'm sorry, the revising the payment standard schedule um, to match fair market rents for the HCV program. So we've already given an, in kind of the intro on why that is needed. Mm -hmm. um, really it's, it's trying to make our vouchers uh, more usable in our area. And we uh, coordinated with Boulder County Housing Authority and Boulder Housing Partners, and everybody is agreed to go up to 105% this year. 
with your approval, um, 105% of the market. So in 2022, we were operating at 100% of fair market value. So this would be a 5% increase to try and help those voucher holders that are out there looking. Okay, so this is uh, LHA 2022 15 resolution. Let's vote on it. Okay, thank you. I was going to say we're going to vote on each one of them as they're presented. So uh, Commissioner Waters uh, made a motion to approve. And did you, Commissioner Yoga seconded? Uh, are there, is there any discussion on this? Yeah. Commissioner Martin. Uh, you said you chose to go to 105%. What's the downside of going to 110%? And presumably they would be able to find more places at 110%. Is that because they're making up the difference? Um, we had to look at our budget. So we had to take the number of vouchers and the amount of money funds we get. Uh -huh. And can we sustain the 105%? And that's what each agency was able to sustain. So that's why we can't go up to 110 if HUD was to give us more money, then we all probably could come back to the table and say, let's go to 110, but it's all all three agencies. We try to keep it the same because we we fund people in Boulder County, they fund people in Boulder County, so. So what avenues do we have to try to persuade the national agencies that are funding us that their definition of market rate is inconsistent with the rents that are charged here, <coughs> that, that there's a market. Do, do we try? Do we tug on sleeves? I mean, there must be. It's HUD. It's HUD. HUD determines. So they, they set the income so that they want to be charged. Yeah. Um, so we have to look at that. Yeah. And that's why we don't have flexibility there in most instances. There's just not a lot of flexibility. We don't know what their methodology is for making these. I mean, they must study something. Yeah, well, so. I the, don't know they'll, they they'll say that, you know, they look at the income data from that, from that, I mean, because they do it by counties, correct? Mm -hmm. And so they'll say that they review the income data that they have coming in from various sources. They'll look at the rental data coming in from various sources and, and Here's your number. Um, the challenge with it is um, it's nationwide, and so they use the same process. And, and so, yeah, they're highly unlikely to change it. I think to answer your question, how do we get more money? Um, I think it goes into all the audits and everything that we've been going through and showing better performance, which then lets us get more funding for the vouchers. But if our people that we award vouchers to can't find a place to live, our performance isn't going to improve. So this is an incremental step in that, and also creating our partnerships to try and um, get landlords more willing to rent to voucher holders. It's a, it's a, yeah, you hit it at all in this, to try and improve the performance. I would also say that just the nature of HUD, just like the incomes that they put out, it's, it's never going to be totally true to today because it, they are using data the best that they can up to a certain point but then that fair market rent is set for a year and what have we seen in our housing market in the last three months yeah. that change yeah. you know, people that are out there looking on right now are not necessarily operating under the same data that the cut is well it's the number lags and so you take where like right now we're at an interesting point so historically in the housing market, when you see, and again, it's, it's what are normal interest rates and what are high interest rates. You know, I think my first house that I bought was like nine or ten percent, which is lower than some folks and what they bought. So, we've gone from a two percent, three percent interest environment to now a six percent interest environment. And when you see, there's some interesting articles on this. And so, what happens is, is when you see that interest rise on home loans, you tend to see more people moving into rental units because they can't get qualified for the home loans, which then is rapidly increasing the, the cost of rental units because there's actually more competition for it. Mm -hmm. And the HUD number lags. So then that creates <laughs> part of the problem. Okay, is there any more discussion? Seeing no, let's vote. I'm going to change 2022 All those in favor. 
Always opposed. So that passes unanimously. Let's go to LHA 2022 16 approval of acceptance of parties. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, the next three resolutions together because they're all very similar. Um, 2022 15, 16, and 17. So this is the, the set of three grants that is coming from the city's CDBG program to the OHA for the Eston Meadows neighborhood playground replacement, the uh, Hover Crossing properties, parking lot and accessibility improvements project, and the security cameras project at uh, various OHA properties, these, the ones that don't already have them, to, to fill out the, to make sure every property has it. So uh, City Council, uh, back in June, approved the CDBG Action Plan, which these were listed and described there. So um, you'd be considered considering tonight accepting that grant fund and allowing us to execute the work. Um, City Council is going to uh, consider that on November 15th, for the same. So, um, that's, mm -hmm. so uh, we'll pass these in a slate, we might as well. So can I have a motion to pass LHA 2022-16, LHA 2022-17, and LHA 2022-18? Thank you for correcting those numbers. I was looking at my old voucher resolution in front of me that was number 15. So sorry about that. Okay. So it's been moved by Commissioner Warren, okay. seconded by Commissioner Hidalgo Perry. Is there any discussion on these? Just, just, to, clarify, just, okay. just to clarify, so we're gonna approve tonight LIJ is going to approve receiving yes, the grants. CBD grants, and we're going to approve awarding them. Right. Moving that one. Mm -hmm. Just we, to be ideally, yeah. we'd have it swapped, but I don't mind schedule. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed. That passes unanimously. Thank you for all that work. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, interim executive director report. Um, so a few things, um, and then we'll go into those specific items that um, we put on the schedule to report to you all. Um, I think one of the, the things that we've been working with recently is there is um, definitely more interest in um, people partnering with, with the housing authority um, today than what we've seen before. And, you know, we kind of talked about this in um, Commissioner Waters made the comment, it's like Shark Tank. Yeah. And um, it, we're really hitting that point where it is like Shark Tank in terms of, so in the, in the last two weeks, we've had somebody talk to us about, um, there, you, you all have some policies in terms of some tax exemptions that properties can get. So one group was looking for it, what does that mean? I think that would result in approximately $130,000 um, in that tax exemption that would come into the housing authority. That's a little more straightforward. Um, we've had a, a developer approach us that has um, a property fairly far into the development process um, that um, is starting to look at LITEX. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you look at LITEX, that's really where we, we can step in from the housing authority perspective we talked about all the budget issues and what we need in the general fund. And so, you know, in the meeting that we had last week, um, you know, we said, here's our interest. We're gonna want management mm -hmm. of the facility and, um, and or development fees depending on how the deal is structured. Um, and so that is part of building the ongoing revenue stream into the LHA general fund to manage that gap. Um, same conversation was on a different parcel of the property in terms of how do you see this working? How does it work with life tax? How does it work, you know, just generally in terms of rental housing? So we know one is right. And so they're gonna go back and do some homework and really look at it. Um, we're, we're pretty focused on they need to have a really good life tech group with them because we don't want to go into a situation like this with someone who doesn't understand it because it is incredibly complicated. Um, so those are two opportunities. So those are three opportunities that has presented themselves um, in terms of the Hover property where we talked about what we were paying. Um, we just finished going through and 
interview process where we put out an RFP for the development of that. We, we talked about modular building, we talked about what we could look at. Um, we had some amazing groups um, submit in that process, which um, to be frank, I don't know if we would have seen that quality of, of um, applicants a year ago. Um, we had nine, nine submittals and we interviewed four, four. that were high, that was, they were all great. So and, and, and so uh, we're working through that. We have to finish going through um, the selection process. We've learned some interesting things in that. You know, we went to visit um, Disney Dwell and that we were very intentional about that modular construction. Um, what we learned is that's probably a little farther ahead than the tax credit world yeah. um, because of the capital outlay and the fact that you have to dump so much money up front in that, mm -hmm. that the investment groups in that tax credit world are exploring it but reluctant just because of the capital outlay on that. We learned about some other modular building techniques that can accomplish something very similar. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of options that we're gonna have at our disposal. Um, and so hopefully within a week, we will uh, finish that process, announce it, and then we're very quickly gonna move into the work of, of meeting with that group and start the, the uh, process of uh, what we want in that location. What's really interesting, and this is how it kind of touches the other side of the organization, and I think this is really where the utility of this partnership comes into play, is um, it went to, well, what if we looked at podium construction? And podium construction is what you saw at 150 Main, where you have an elevated lower level and then you have the units above it. That gives you the ability to get your density that you need on the structure. And then on the basis, you can condo the area underneath, and that opens up the doors to things like childcare. That opens up the doors to things like a library annex, a commercial space that helps build the bridge the financial gap. So, you know, we'll start that work once we announce it and we, we begin to work with them on it. And so, we were, I, I was really pleased. Um, I don't know about Molly, but it was, I mean, we were blown away by the folks that stepped into this and, and the work that they've done. So in probably a couple of weeks, we're going to start on the beginning of that development of that property. So what is so cool about it is, well, first of all, it's, it started morphing. We had this idea, but we wanted to get the developer's ideas. And by the end of the four interviews, we're, we're looking at a family hub is what it really really seems like them. Um, mm -hmm. We want to serve, um, get larger sized units, which is difficult under LIHTC, three and four bedrooms, difficult under LIHTC, but if you come in with um, either library or early child care space or other similar things, those are count as amenity space. Mm -hmm. And then the tax credits end up funding a part of that. And it allows you to, you have the extra source to even do the three and four bedrooms. So, it's really just taking shape. And, it's, really interesting. and that's where NDC and the contract we have with them in the city, they'll come in and slide beside us and help us maneuver through mm -hmm. the tax credit world. And, and so, um, you know, that's an update. Obviously, um, in the last meeting, we updated you on where we sit with Zinnia now. And I think they've gone through their second review. We think we're pretty good. So, Probably before the next meeting, we're going to be moving into the closing process um, on that property. So we'll we'll transfer the property by the end of the year. Correct. And then we'll be at the closing on the financing is scheduled for May, but from January to May, it'll be very much. Yeah. Uh, in we'll process. transfer the property, and so then I think we're looking at starting the construction in May. Mm -hmm. May June. Remind me, where that property is. It's adjacent to the suites. Oh, that one. Okay. And so, um, Molly the can, flower being Molly, uh, oh. yeah, yes. the name. Yes. Um, Sunset to Bluebird <laughs> to Zinnia. Oh, okay. Sunset to Bluebird. So Zinnia now is the code name for the project. Zinnia is the, is the official the, name. Is the official of name. Project. Um, <laughs> so, so part of it was, uh, 
a lot of us are incredibly bad with names. I think we said, well, there's a lot of native flowers in Colorado, so looking at it as a campus-wide project, and because there's another in that land transfer, remember, this is just stage one. There's another property that's there, and then we have some other areas that we're looking at building. Um, I think learning from the Hover, we may want to reset kind of what we're thinking about in that multifaceted housing approach, that Hover property. Um, so, so yeah, in, in March I'll go. Um, Molly, I'll have, you know, so we talked to you all about um, approaching the conversations with Recovery Cafe, um, and that is because we needed more supportive services in that area, specifically uh, on the recovery side and what we're seeing. Um, and so Molly, Molly's just been knee deep into that one with them. That one's complicated because it involves the tax investors, a ground lease, connecting to the building, um, and I think we're, we're at a point where we're taking the next step with architects. Yeah, so um, in order to attach it to the suites, which makes it eligible for CDBG funds, which we have CDBG, CB, so COVID funds that have been um, challenging to spend down before we hit an expenditure deadline coming up. So on November 29th, City Council will be considering moving some of those CDBG funds around to fund the Recovery Cafe, because that's a perfect use of those funds in terms of that eligibility. But that means we have to attach it to the suites, which means we are talking about, that is a, a property owned by a, a, an entity that the, the, the equity investor is involved in. So we have to get all these approvals um, and it's difficult. However, if we can make it work, then we would have the services on site. Um, they would have a street presence, which is exactly what they want, like a, a storefront style. Um, and also they wouldn't have to go out and find land or a building to purchase, which means they can put more of the funding that they're getting to the actual facility. So it it's hard, it's not easy, it's not the easy route, but if we can swing it, it's really worth it. So we're really working for that. So just yesterday, um, we worked with Recovery Cafe to craft an RFP for uh, feasibility and architecture, and that should be, should have an award there in uh, the end of November. So and that'll help us figure out really what to do feasibility wise. So why is this important and why is this important in this location? Can you bring that up? Um, so we're gonna show you some pictures. Make sure that the ones with non residents get to know what they see. Yeah. Okay. Elements is still our development partner on they Zenia. Are. On Zenia, correct. Zenia. Not necessarily on no. this project. No. Now we thought about attaching it, but we were too far down. So we just, um, so we said this week, and we kind of talked about what, what's creating the workload. Um, they moved up some evictions on her, so we're going to kind of show you this. This go back to that one. So uh, is there a way to change it? To is it upside down? No, I think it's upside down. Can we rotate that? Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, that looks better. So if you can kind of see this, what, you, what you're seeing on it is basically uh, drug paraphernalia. So this, this was an eviction that we went through. How long have they been in the unit? At least four months. So the, these pictures are from today. From today. These pictures are from today, but the person was in the unit, they've only been in there four months. This they, is in the suites? This is in the suites. Mm -hmm. So you see these, the, the drug paraphernalia there, go to the next one. Um, now you're gonna have to flip again. Um, so again, you see more guns. Those are BB guns. We so, all said that. Yeah. Those are BB guns. <laughs> so um, you can see more drug paraphernalia. You can see drug paraphernalia there. You can see the meth that, that's here in, in this location. Um, and so Lisa showed me these and. And we've talked about the evictions, but we haven't necessarily shown you, mm -hmm. A, what do they deal with when they're in this, but also I think it's the importance of really bringing that recovery component into that location, because we have a lot of people that are being successful. We have some that have been successful that because of the nature of people who are around there that they've relapsed. 
And so having that presence from a recovery standpoint in a facility like this, I think is incredibly important. And you know, what I've said to Molly is, what's the value in this? The value is you avoid two meth contaminated units and your ROI's back. I mean, it, it's a pretty simple mathematical equation. And, and so we think that's really important on this. As a side note, uh, Molly went to Denver to look at tour property of which where when we get more information, we're gonna to talk to you all about what Denver has done. It is really cool. Um, but um, they had found that the meth detectors are now being marketed and sold. And so, yeah. Um, but so Molly's gonna communicate with them and try to get the folks from New Zealand to, to try to come in and, and talk to folks about this. And so we know now that they are marketing it. And um, we're gonna send some other things to them. So it's interesting that New Zealand's kind of leading the pack right now in, in this, this work. So hopefully in the near future, we will have more information on that. If this, if this is a four month tenant, and we've got money budgeted for background checks for each of our properties, what do we miss? What are we checking? Well, we're doing the background checks. Um, the things that are coming up, because they plead them down in court, so we only get to see what it's pled down to. And if it's not something that HUD allows us to deny for, we have to allow them in. And we can only deny if they manufacture in public housing. So they can manufacture in the old house that they lost to uh, foreclosure, and they can be convicted of that and can't deny for it. Correct, and depending on how it's reported through the court system. So cooking meth is a reason to be excluded. Mm -hmm. Contaminating to use of meth is not. Mm -hmm. And even if you're cooking meth and you get evicted, but the eviction is for non-payment of rent, something right. else suppressed, yeah. that does not show up on the record. So I've asked, I've asked, and, and I'll be honest, as I've talked to the, the landlord, uh, I've been pretty overt to say when, when you have these issues, and I think this is why we're being so dogged on it, on the eviction, is if we're not dogged on this case, saying what the issues are, and it's non-payment, we're just sending someone else up yep. exactly. for the same issue. Exactly. And Lisa, who's been talking to the um, Apartment Association about how do we collectively start getting focused and on the same page where when this comes up we're dealing with it because otherwise if she's an apartment owner and we and I don't deal with it to set her up for the same issue because we're all under the same fair housing laws and 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 so that's the piece of following through the evictions and getting through and buttoning this up from a legal perspective because while they can't be prohibited for using the eviction mm -hmm. is a different Yeah, we can tool. not allow them for eviction. And if they owe another landlord a substantial amount of money, so this is where our collection piece that Kendra has been really working on, as these meth units are coming up and we're notating it and we're sending it over to collection, then it's going on their credit report. And so as a landlord, it's not what I found. So what I found out is collections is a whole new ball game now, and you cannot, and collection agencies will not accept um, anything that's a fee or a fine. Mm -hmm. So if we're getting fines or fees for meth or cleaning and all of that, you can't do anything about it. It will never go to collection. It, you can go to collections, but it will never get on their credit report. So it doesn't secure anybody that's going to get this person. And unless there's a judgment, and then you have to act on that judgment. But the judgments usually are determined based on amount. And those decisions get made. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, our own city mediation is working them against us because they're going to like buy down. You know, well, all right. We'll, we'll, if you get out by this certain date, we're not going to put an eviction on your record. I mean, 
So, so what we're doing is throwing hand grenades at potential landlords by putting certain people out on the street. And if they become unrentable to, then they have no option but to freeze and die on the streets. So we don't have a, we don't have a way to salvage these people at all. That's what it comes to. Well, I think, I think the answer is there is, and we're seeing some groups do this. Um, we, we talked to the Salvation Army, I think is, as you look at, and, and I'm gonna call it transitional housing. Not transitional housing, not permanent supportive housing, but a transitional housing component where how do you normalize? Because it's it's the normal it's it's the normalizing that's getting lost in this. So you use transitional for two different categories just then. Yeah, I said I'm gonna call so so what happens is and, and what we see really pre predominantly at the suites is we see people that are moved into into permanent supportive housing that are not ready for permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. And when, you know, we, the mayor and I had a conversation with Salvation Army, you know, Molly talked to folks at this other facility, what we're finding is there's actually a step before that. And, and the step is, and I'm using the word transitional housing, we want to put, what they do is, whether it's what the Salvation Army's doing in Denver with pallet <coughs> homes, whether it's what they're doing at this other facility, is they're moving folks into what I would say is a quasi-housing environment. And they're re-engaging into some pretty basic behaviors. When to wash your clothes. When to take showers. Because so much of that has been lost over time and so they are normalizing individuals via that process. And then they're moving them into permanent supportive housing and they tend to be more successful versus just saying, this is the life I've been in. I'm moving you into permanent supportive housing and so many people don't stop it. I mean, it's like the stories that you hear where one, one story we heard, they put a guy into housing and he had to sleep in his tent in his living room for a couple of months because he was he was not ready for that transition, and so there, those are some things we're starting to look in. And the mayor's throwing a lot of stuff to us that she's heard about that is really starting to reshift my mind. But to your point, in terms of this, that is why, as a landlord, you, you listen to we we've been on the other side of mediation, and we're like, no, nope, this behavior is so egregious, so disruptive. We can't do this, and and then at times in other legal cases we reserved our right, and the one where we had the huge meth level, we reserved our right, and we did go back to the court to say we want a judgment on this. So now that it's a judgment, they can put it into. Now we have to act on it. We get it into collections, and then that goes on the record. And that person can't get a lease anywhere More than likely. so going back to this and the reason for um, recovery cafe is that once they transition to supportive housing they need a support system there mm -hmm. and if they don't have the support system it's too easy to go back to old habits mm -hmm. so it is a continuation and it helps LHA because the hopefully then will be ahead of any issues that would come up with the tenants. They have somebody on site to go to that is helping with therapy sessions on a weekly basis or whatever that is. Because otherwise, for me, the cost of not having this and continually having meth problems in our in our units, we can't get ahead of it. So and and the, the, here, here. if you're a private landlord, we heard it from Mr. Sandoval. Yes. You can't find insurance for meth remediation. The only reason we're able to still be insured is because we're in 
insurance portfolio that is solely for housing authorities. Mm -hmm. At what point does that loss ratio shift so much that they, that they stop doing it? Because then you 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 can't afford it. Right. I mean, you've seen the, the, the budget. And, um, and then what you're doing is you're penalizing those people who aren't doing that, who are willing to do what they need to be to be housed, and, and then they're losing their housing because you can't afford to continue to remediate units. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tough cycle. It is. So, so, so who are the decision makers uh, that inform collection agencies what they can or cannot include on a record? Uh, the, 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 the cycles that you just described, Harold, uh, are those, is that Congress? Is that, is that agency leadership without accountability? I mean, where are those decisions being made that put us in a position, and housing authorities everywhere, potentially to put folks who are following all the rules, right, who are so dependent upon this housing and doing it the right way at risk because of folks who don't follow any of the rules and are, you know, abusing every norm that, that we would expect residents to abide by. I, mean. I can definitely ask DC Services, it's the same collection agency. She made it sound like it was the credit agencies, but there may be laws attached to that exactly. um, that have driven where they say, you know, we can't do fines, we can't do fees. And then they, they'll collect as far as they can but then what they do is they do this, the collection agencies do this formula, and they have to do a formula to get even move to the next step for litigation. And for our properties, it would never make it because they have to see that that person can pay it before it moves to the next step. So if we have low income housing, a lot of the times those, those people aren't gonna show that they can actually pay it. If they can, then it goes to litigation. They pay all the lawyer fees, but then when they get the money, it automatically pays their lawyer fees first, but then it could go to collections if we can get it to there. But, um, but before we before we funded ourselves from the place, when we're kicked out of an insurance pool we got, or yeah. collaborate, collaborative, is it CML? Is it NCL? Uh, I mean, there's got to be some place that, that these issues can be addressed with whoever the decision makers are. And I think that's the piece where we need to start getting our, ourselves into some of these housing authority conferences because I don't I don't know that it'll be NLC or CML or it, it, it'll be housing authority specific. And so we're gonna have to, but we'll dig that up because, yeah. So, so I, I, it's sort of off topic except I guess we're looking at getting into it, but what they're doing in Denver, if this is like, this is like CDC, I guess, Colorado Village Collaborative, they're the pallet homes people. Um, but the question is, what do they do that's different from the Swedes? I mean, it's one thing to teach people how to, how to cook, how to take a shower, um, how to wash your clothes, but if you keep cooking meth, it doesn't matter whether you're clean or dirty, you're keeping to cook meth. Can I, uh, that, is the, that is the point of the tour. I think finding out that information and bringing it back. Yeah. So, so, so what that, we, what we, we can't answer that at this point. What we learned when we talked to the Salvation Art, zero tolerance. Mm. I mean, so it's like BC, think of the BCP model where BCP, BCP does this. And it's where you can come in, you can have a place, you can do this. You don't follow the rules, zero tolerance. How do they find out you didn't? How did this guy get in with all that? Well, so, so it's a little bit different in that they have inspections and everything else, and, and they have a process. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, we're going to get some tours set up for you all to kind of go through and look at it, but it's, it's a different standard than permanent supportive housing because that's, once you cross into housing, you have rights. You have all of these rules. And, and they're on the front end of that. And so that's where we're gonna get some of these tours set up for you all. Um, but, um, but that's consistent. I mean, I've heard it now from BCP, I've heard it from the Salvation Army, it, is that they have pretty hard and fast standards. Mm -hmm. And if you don't follow those standards, then you're not allowed to stay there. 
And so those that are following those standards then do tend to be really, really successful. I just think that this person right here who's only been in this unit for four months already knew what they were doing. Of course. Mm -hmm. You know. They started causing trouble right As soon as they got in there. Mm -hmm. Right. And they already did their research. They already know mm -hmm. what they can and what they can't do. They already know once they get in, they can't get kicked out unless they get found. Yep. And so, um, so it's really, really background checks only do so much, mm -hmm. you know, um, as far as behaviors. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the people like that who already know how to, how to, you know, yeah, get to get in the system and work the system and, um, and do what they need to do. But the people who've been in housing for 10 years and start hanging around the wrong people, those are the ones who slowly end up getting into trouble. But this person already knew what they were doing. Sure. Which is why I think that the um, recovery cafe is such a good idea to get eyes in the situation. You know how to deal with it. Well, or support for the individuals that are tempted that yes. have an avenue yes. to to go somewhere else. Yep. And uh, so, so good. that's why I think we've got some better points we want to talk about. Yeah, your occupancy report and property updates. The catch was um, the end of September's occupancy reports. We did have a decline in occupancy and we did drop to 92%. Part of this is um, about a third of our vacant units are down units. On the bottom, midway through the page, you will see our meth contamination units. Um, two of those have now. One is almost back on the market, someone we'll hear about this week, which has been down over a year. That one um, has been completely restored by our reconstruction company, but now we have to go in and do the final maintenance, get it all ready, clean it, get it completely ready for occupancy, get it furnished, because this week we do furnish the units and trying to get beds right now. We mm -hmm. cannot get an affordable bed. I need 12 beds for the suites and trying to find a company that can get us a bed at less than 500 is not possible. <laughs> right. So that's one of the struggles we're running in there. Um, let's see. What are your bed costs? What are they coming in? I think Diana said she had some at 700, 900. And right now we know we need about 12 beds for the suites. So what is it? The mattress or the mattress, box springs, and frame? We're, we're set on couches, dressers, we still have a supply of those from when the suites was originally, I guess, got bought. We have brand new, everything else but beds, we don't. So when you have a meth unit, it all gets trashed. Yeah. Even the next leg box. Can you use the last <laughs> box? No, okay, no, that's sad. <laughs> everything goes. Some of the counters, the, um, the mantles in the suite, some of them have fireplaces and they have a mat mantle, depending on what it's made out of, has to go. If it's a porous surface, it has to be ripped out. So some of these units are pretty sad when they're done. Um, let's see. I've, go ahead. Oh, um, Aspen Senior, we still have um, a meth unit there. We thought that was gonna be a simple clean, but when they went back to do the retesting, the levels were still high, so that required the kitchen cabinets coming out. And this, wow, this unit was just redone last year. Half the flooring had to come out from the bathroom and the hallways. The cabinets had to come out. Everything in the bathroom basically had to come out. I just, I just, I just can't get my mind wrapped around residents at Aspen Meadows destroying a unit through the use of meth. Mm -hmm. Within a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Fall River one that we have currently, that's a meth unit that was an uh, eviction hoarding situation, pack out, um, highest levels, the, well, second highest level the test company has ever seen in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. well, front, range. Front, front range. Front range. Yes. So, front range. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. We, we're in the 2000s. Most of ours come in between, uh, white cleaning would be anything from 0.6 to maybe 1. Two. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our Suite units are in the hundreds. Mm. This one at Fall River, came, the bedroom I believe was 2,000. 
The bathroom was a thousand. Why wasn't the person dead? Don't know. So on that one, we incurred even additional costs because on some of these, we have to test the neighboring units, people across the hall, down the hall. So all that adds up to cleaning costs. I don't think we have a property that's the village for testing. Village for testing. And the, the, heart, the heartstone, pretty much. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Where can we get those now? <laughs> that, that's what we're trying to do with because they're expensive. They're like five or $600. Yeah, $600 right. each. It's an alarm, like a, like a smoke alarm. Yeah. Okay. But mm -hmm. if you catch it early enough, then it's a clean versus what we're talking about. But even then, I mean, $600 a pop, you avoid one unit. Yeah. And, and they you, pay for and themselves. And they pay for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and so anyway. Mm -hmm. The other problem on the waiting list is, um, especially in our age restricted units, we've talked to you about this before, is we're just not seeing people that can come in and take the units. Um, they're either not ready, they're not out of their lease. Um, and so, we're digging, we're gonna dig into a little more to understand what's happening in, in that sector uh, because it's definitely changed and it changed pretty fast on us. And I don't think it's unique to us. I think it's something that everyone's starting to see in age restricted units. Yeah, so currently we do have three waiting lists open. Um, Fall River, Aspen Meadow Senior, and Village Place all have wait list opening and everybody who's applying for the wait list are not looking to move for six months to a year. Oh, and so as Diane and I are getting calls, we are, you know, set, call, sending them straight to these properties and saying they have availability. You know, they can they can accommodate you today as long as you meet the background and credit criteria. And so we're trying, but it, it's it's a uphill battle most days. Um, we have had a few move-ins though this past month, and um, working on a couple more. Um, this report does show the Hearthstone having two vacants. They are fully rented right now, so they are back at 100% occupied. And two of the, the meth units have, like I said, have come off. Um, F3 at Aspen Neighborhood, that one's been down for quite a while, a little over a year. That's now the manager's unit. She has moved in and she is living there at the neighborhood. Um, we added a new one at the neighborhood, B2. Um, that one will probably be uh, full gut as well and rebuild. And the one today we anticipate being a full gut as well. We had a few other um, units that were down, are down for a while, Fall River. We had a biohazard. Um, we're still waiting on replacement flooring. They can't get the flooring. So it's either replace the whole unit or find that flooring. And um, a4, which was another bad one over at the neighborhood. That one's been, now it's reoccupied though. And then the suites, um, we had a biohazard cleanup. Um, and we're waiting, they're testing the flooring to see if the seeped into the flooring and if it can be cleaned or need to be replaced. Hey, just real quick on that one on the flooring. Run what the floor replacement will be. Okay. And then that way we can look at what the cost differential is in terms of rental time. Because okay. it may be better financially just to replace. Um, and then the next report was the unit vacancy report. So you can kind of see how long some of these units have been vacant, who we've called that we've had people overqualify, overqualify. We've had one unit at Spring Creek that we've had two rentals, they've been fully approved and then they backed out because the neighbors let them know that was a previous meth unit. Oh. So, so oh. it's just a struggle. Um, so this report I will include um, every quarter going forward so you can kind of just see the longevity of the vacancies and why they been, haven't been rented or the struggles we're seeing with those units. And um, to quickly touch on the property updates. Um, the quarterly management walks I had start. I had started last quarter. I'm walking each property top to bottom every quarter. And this led into many of the things that I submitted to Kendra for budget needs. Some of them will be taken in, um, care of in 2022. The other ones are budgeting out for 2023. And this is anything from landscaping improvements, um, patio furniture that's failing, that needed replaced for years, but never kind of always had to look over. So we are each quarter going out to the properties, I'm putting my eyes on it, I'm following up with the maintenance staff, seeing where things are, what needs to be done next, and just making sure they're following through and everybody's being held accountable and that we're getting these things accomplished. 
So when Lisa says top to bottom, she's not joking. She's literally on the roof, from the roof to, to the landscaping. Try to make sure we have it all covered. What? Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> um, another thing, like Eileen pointed out, the VS started today. I'm, I'm excited for that. I know the residents were really excited. Um, two weeks ago, we rushed through and had VIA go out to all the properties with about a 48-hour notice and had a great turnout at all the properties of residents who may have not been ready to start taking transportation, but they know as the winter months come that they need to transition to somebody else driving for them. So that was a lot of the feedback we heard at those meetings. And so very excited. Some of the property things we have been doing um, in October, we had Boulder County Health Department come in. They did COVID vaccinations and the flu shots for the seniors. Our last one is scheduled for Friday at the suites. They will be coming in and providing to any resident who wants it free of charge. Um, we also did resident photo day, which um, I can't wait to get to show you guys some of these photos. Uh, we had some photographers on our staff and we got the backdrops and literally held picture day like when they were in school. And the resident excitement for these, they're bringing their, their dogs with them posing. Um, they're like, some of them were like, oh, this is gonna be my Christmas card. This is what I'm giving out. And um, we're hoping to start doing this actually almost twice a year now because of just the excitement from the residents and made them feel very young for the day. They got to get all dolled up, do their hair, their makeup. Um, they invited like family members to come pose with them as well. So it was very fun. <laughs> Big hit. Well, it, it, when you hire people that know the world mm -hmm. and do a good job, I mean, this was something that Lisa and her staff came up with. And I think that's when you kind of tie back to your question of what was the issue. The issue was really getting folks like this to take that interest and do it. And I, my team's been amazing. I was all set to help out with these and then I had an unexpected death in the family and my team 100% jumped in and covered every spot, executed, edited the photos, got them to me. So very proud of my team for that. Um, couple of just property updates. I'm not gonna go through all of these. The suites had, um, MHEG come out, that's their investor. They did a top to bottom walk as well. And they were very happy with the condition of the property. They were happy with the resident feedback they got when they were on site. The calls for service there have remained low over the last few weeks, so excited about that. And um, Chaffa came out and did an audit. They did um, files and a video tour of the property. Um, only thing they had was a couple minor findings that we had fixed within 48 hours. So. No findings went reported. Aspen Meadows had the, the same day a CHAPA audit, same thing, no, uh, only minor findings, everything's been corrected. Their investor also did an audit. Uh, we're still pending those results on that one. And um, Palace Construction did come out and fix some of the items that we had um, from the renovation that were failing. We noticed the dumpster, um, the beams around the dumpster that were supposed to be pure cedar were cracked and failing, so we you said those wrong, they've already replaced all those with the right material. They got the manufacturer for the outdoor benches and tables that were um, on their second floor. They were all warped and the manufacturer's replacing all those and bringing them, I believe, Friday. Mm -hmm. They've repainted um, anywhere that brick was chipping, so they're, they're holding up their warranty even though we're just past the warranty period. They're making sure everything is corrected. Village Place, we had a great coffee conversations with Harold. Um, I know they're very anxious for the re-syndication and I know we're meeting later this week to go over the next steps and what the resident surveys are gonna look like and getting them towards of Aspen Meadows so that they can see kind of what it's going to look like or some of the options that will be going on. And that's the most of it. <laughs> so, I've been in with some good news. I was strategic in doing this. <laughs> so if you're going to end on good news, I'm going to make one more observation. I don't mean it to be bad news, but I, but I am going to take it back to our goals and objectives. I, if I'm just listening to this conversation, um, uh, I might wonder, we have as a target here, preserving, we've stated preserving, or uh, preserving up to 200 existing affordable housing units and then six new developments. One might wonder why we are, why we're interested in more units, if it, at a 92% occupancy rate, and 
struggling to fill some of those needs. Yeah. But the overall goal is that we would do an assessment to look at housing types, demographics of a population to determine what the demand is going to become. I'm guessing we haven't done that, or we have seen the results of that. But, but look, if I go back to this, had we done that, we now could talk about housing types and, and the type of, and the demographics of a population that, that we're, we're trying to build out, right, to satisfy or it needs to meet. And, and I don't know how to connect those dots as I'm sitting here listening to the struggles to get, you know, things filled for, for predictable reasons that, you know, I understand. Um, if, if we don't tie it back to this and then make adjustments, I'm not certain why we do this. So, so we got the grant from DOLA, and when we put the grant out the first time for an RFP, we didn't have any responses. Um, we put it out the second time, we have had responses, and that work is actually underway right now. About to sign the contract. Which, which will then be the basis for this. Uh, yeah, you get my point? Yeah. yeah. That all of this, the, con the context for all of it, sh should be grounded, I think, back in this set of goals and objectives that we set. And then we can adjust, and whatever performance targets we need to set this next year, whether it's occupancy rates, numbers of units, types of units, dem the, de the demographics that we're trying to, to accommodate. So. Yeah, and, and so, you know, when we look at these other projects and why um, we're focusing on family units, because we know that is the gap that we're seeing in the community. And so we're, we're, we're not looking at more age-restricted units because of these issues, but that work will then form into more of the ongoing basis for it. But yeah, that was a, a product of the, the, the world. Um, good news on this is, so we had, so you've heard audit, audit, audit. That's probably been the last six months of the work that has really been undertaken by the staff in terms of, and when we talk about staff capacity and what they're able to do, um, you have HUD audits, you have investor audits, you have DOLA audits, you have CHAPA audits. And so obviously, um, just because of the nature of what the condition when we took it over, there's, it seems like an audit every month. Every month, more like <laughs> multiple every week. Yeah, and so, so that's really what's been eating up staff time. Because those audits are, are insane. So you have to go through and you have to inspect all the units, make sure nothing's wrong, and then cross your fingers that people don't change what you've inspected. Remove smoke detectors, do things like that because that happens. So we have to document it. So even before the audit, there's a, a massive amount of work that they have to go through, review files, make sure the files are in order because you never know what they're going to pick. You have to go through, inspect the property, inspect the units. And then they will remove smoke detectors, but then because we have it documented that the smoke detector was connected and it was moved, and they can attribute that to then the resident, and it's a little bit different. So, why aren't smoke detectors installed in a tamper-proof way? It sounds like it sounds like you're talking about the same smoke detectors that was on the ceiling of my trapped house when I moved in. It's a way to build. Why? I don't know, we weren't here. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, obviously, we're, obviously, you don't want to do that. And, and that was only one case, but it, it could be light bulbs, you name it. Um, we had our biggest audit um, last week. That was the MOR audit, which is an audit for the lodge and the Hearthstone, which is a HUD audit that, um, in terms of what they had to do to get ready for that, was more significant than anything they had to do. That was the same audit that we got in 2021, right before we took over, or, or right as we were transitioning into it. And so Molly and I got to meet with the auditor, and we're still waiting on the results, but um, he kind of sobered us when he said, I think we only scored like a 20 out of 100 in 2001, based on where 2021. they- 2021. based on where they were at that time and the only reason that they probably the word for the only reason they got any points at all was the, because of the condition of the facility they basically got no points for anything else in those facilities um including our tenant files and policies finances and conditions 
all of those issues. And so it was probably as bad a fail as you can imagine. Um, we, we did the debrief with him um, and he said it was dramatically different. Um, a 180 in terms of what they had to deal with. Um, he said, I no longer have to guess where the funding's going to because the funding is really completely outlined for us. Um, apparently, we didn't know that when they were asking for certain financial statements before, historically, that the staff at the time would say, we can't give it to you, or the board won't allow us to give it to you. And yeah. Really? Yeah, yes. Um, and which is bizarre to me because it's an open record. Right. And, and so he basically said, I never have to guess where anything is. I know where it is. Um, so the condition's awesome. Um, we think uh, that worst case scenario, we're going to get a satisfactory. Just um, show the we think it time. could be a little bit higher than that. and. Um, I think it's impossible to move as far as we hope to do, um, but he's going to give us what they judge the units on so that we can start using that to set the standards in terms of where we want to be and what to the point of objectives or what are the objectives for lease and the management, what are the objectives of the operation and make, or the maintenance staff because that really is the bar that we need to, to try to hit in order to get that. But and then at the end we said well you know we're fighting with HUD on some other issues tell us about your perception of the city taking over this and his comment was um, I hope the city never gets away from this based on the difference and so we're hoping that it comes back at least it's satisfactory but the preliminary review was um, night and day difference between what was there before and what, what's there now. So to put a number on it, is a satisfactory a 60, a 75? Because you had a 20 before. A 70. A 70. So it's, it's um, failed, yeah. below average, or uh, be I'm messing up the categories. Something like below average, satisfactory, above average, exceptional. Um, he said, don't expect to go from where we were to exceptional in one year, but um, that could be a thing over time. But we are expecting a satisfactory, which is a very good thing for one year's worth of progress. So you, you basically have a baseline now for yourself, which mm -hmm. you didn't have before. Right. Sounds like a performance failure to me. Yeah. Well, that's why we asked him for your measurement, what, what they do to judge it, because we've never had that kind of conversation to know how do you judge your facilities mm -hmm. and even those that aren't HUD facilities will use the same thing for all of our facilities to go here's how we're going to set the targets and uh, it was good information and, and he had history uh, with the unit even when he worked with DOLA and others so it was a good conversation and we were kind of I think dreading Not, we knew we would made a big difference but you know, honestly for Lisa and her staff, and he had a lot of praises for Andrea and Lisa and just the different interaction um, over and over again. You didn't know that, she didn't, but he had a lot of praise for them. Again, it goes back to your staff, it goes back to the quality. Um, and um, yeah, we were pretty happy when we left that. It made my next three days off or whatever <laughs> much better. <laughs> but um, that, I mean, it's, it's the entire group, and, and I think it's um, just going to continue to be incremental. But I wanted to, after all of the other news, I wanted to let you know they did phenomenal on that. And they've done that with their investor audits and everything else they've gone through. Um, it's been a good year for them, and, and it, you know, it's a different world. Yes, congratulations, yes. Great. So is there any more? That's it for your report. Commissioner comments. Do you have any more comments? We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Commissioner Martin, seconded by Commissioner Um All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you very much.